Okay, welcome brothers and sisters to another episode of the Bible Questions and Answers brought to you by the Assembly of Yahushua. Our topic for today concerns the tabernacle and how it points to or typifies our King Yahushua. Now, before we go ahead and proceed, let us first offer a prayer of thanksgiving. Everlasting Father, most holy and gracious Yahuwah, we are truly thankful and grateful for the, for the blessings that you have bestowed upon our life. Thank you for always providing for our needs, covering for our weaknesses, because it is your nature. Your attributes speak mightily that indeed by your unfailing love and compassion, up to this very hour, we stand before your presence in awe of what you have done and what you will continue to do. Today, we will study all about the tabernacle. We believe, Father, you have provided this because of your love and your desire to fellowship with your people. Our King Yahushua, we firmly believe the scriptures are about you. And so we will discover that today. May you bless us in our studies and may you help us to deeply understand the meaning of everything that we learn and how it points ultimately to you and your work of sanctification. Father, we believe that you have listened to our prayers in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahusha Hamashia. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, we are truly happy that we can be gathered together once again to study the words of our Father and of His beloved Son, Yahusha Hamashia. Of course, we came from our observance or celebration of the Day of Atonement, and we know that during the Day of Atonement and throughout the services rendered by the people of ancient Israel, it's centered around what is called the tabernacle. Because in the tabernacle, there was an opportunity for the people of Israel to enter the outer court to offer their burnt sacrifices to Yahuwah uh, through the mediation of the priests and the Levites. And once a year, we know that Aaron, the high priest, is able to enter the most holy place where there is the Ark of the Covenant. So we know the tabernacle is the center of worship. And as they progress as a kingdom, during the days of Solomon, they established the temple, which followed the pattern of the tabernacle. And so we know from scripture that everything that is done in the Old Testament, it points prophetically to our king, Yahushua. This is why the question that we're going to answer today is the tabernacle also pointing to Yahushua. In other words, how does the tabernacle typify Yahushua. Now, before we can properly address this question, I think we need to first determine, well, what is the meaning of the word typology or to typify? What is biblical typology? Well, biblical typology is basically prophetic symbols. We know throughout scripture, there are literal symbols. Like, for example, a star can symbolize something else. It can symbolize an angel, for example. 
But there are also other prophetic symbols that we find throughout scripture, which we call typology. And so typology refers to a person, a thing, or an event that took place in the Old Testament that symbolized prophetically or in the future, uh, pointing to something that will be fulfilled by our king, uh, by our father, Yahuwah. And usually, as we have uncovered, typically everything in the Old Testament points forward to who? Yahushua. And so we have typologies, for example, of human beings. Moses is a type of Yahushua. Joseph is a type of Yahushua. But also it can refer to things like the rock that was struck or the water or the manna. It also points to Yahushua. So we have people, we have things. We also have events like the Akedah, where Abraham was told to or instructed to offer his son Isaac. This event pointed to the future work of our father, Yahuwah, when he sacrifices beloved son. So these are examples of biblical typology, prophetic symbols that point forward to the work of Yahuwah through his son, Yahushua. And so we're going to go into an in-depth study of the tabernacle because it was central uh, throughout the worship services rendered by the people of ancient Israel. So the tabernacle, does it also typify our King Yahushua? Let's read here in the book of Hebrews 9, 8 to 9. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance of the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time for the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the conscience of the people who bring them. And so the Bible tells us during the new covenant, the tabernacle and what it represents under the old covenant is an illustration pointing to a future time. And Yahushua came, that future time was fulfilled. So indeed, the tabernacle was a prophetic symbol. It pointed forward to something in the future of the work under the new covenant, which is mediated by who? Not Moses, but a greater Moses, who happens to be, of course, none other than Yahushua HaMashiach. And so we're going to look at how the tabernacle, a prophetic symbol, points to our king, Yahushua. And so when the tabernacle was instructed uh, to be built by Yahuwah, he told Moses, okay, you need to build a tabernacle, what blueprint was given to Moses? The, uh, Exodus 25, 8 to 9, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. You must build this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will show you. And so when Yahuwah instructs Moses how to build a tabernacle, it reveals to us two things about the tabernacle. What is, what are they? Number one, the purpose of Yahuwah in instructing the building of the tabernacle. What is that purpose? Yahuwah wants to tabernacle or fellowship with his people. He wants to live among the people of Israel. But we all know Yahuwah is holy, people of Israel, not too holy. As a matter of fact, the Bible says they are a stubborn and stiff-necked people. And Yahuwah at one point said, I cannot go with them because I'm holy. They're stubborn and stiff-necked. And so his holiness, when there is an attempt for what is holy to what is not holy to approach the holiness and glory of Abba, what would happen to those who were not holy? They would be obliterated or annihilated by the holiness of Yahuwah. However, this did not stop Yahuwah from wanting to fellowship with his people. So he tells Moses, build a tabernacle. This is the system by which Yahuwah can bring himself near his people because he loves his people. And number two, the Bible tells us that Yahuwah tells Moses that the tabernacle is to be built according to a pattern, a pattern that Yahuwah will show him. And that pattern looks like this. And so this is a representation on paper or a two-dimensional representation of the tabernacle. It has three main parts. You have the outer courtyard, you have the holy place, 
and you have the holy of holy. So, so a person enters from the east through a gate. There's only one gate, which is the entrance to the tabernacle. There's no other gate except for that one gate. And so a person entering the gate um, will enter first the outer courtyard. There is the altar of burnt offerings, the laver, then the holy place or the tabernacle itself. The main tabernacle itself is that, or the tent, we can call it the tent, is actually composed of two parts, the holy place and the most holy place called the holy of holy. So that's the blueprint. That's the pattern of the tabernacle. And we know because Yahushua himself said so, that everything in the scriptures is all about him or point to him. John 5.39, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. This is why one of the most exciting aspects about studying the Old Testament scriptures is discovering how different events and people and things in the Old Testament, the rituals, the commandments, it's very exciting to discover how they point to who? Yahusha. You see, Yahusha is telling us he's the key. If we want to gain insight, if we want a deeper understanding of Yahuwah's plan and purpose for salvation, the key to understanding scripture is Yahushua. When we see the scripture and read scripture from the lens of our King Yahushua, we have this treasure of knowledge and wisdom that will be poured upon our hearts and our minds for our edification. So we're going to put this to the test. Is it true that when we look at the Old Testament, for example, the tabernacle, that it points to our King Yahushua? That's what we're going to test today. So let's look at the pattern again of the tabernacle. This is how it looks like. A person enters the east gate. There's only one gate, right? And there's no other gate, no other opening. Just like in, the, in Noah's ark, there was only one door. Yahuwah told Noah, I want you to build an ark, and this ark is going to have only one door. Here, the tabernacle, it only has one gate or one door. And how does this point to our King Yahushua? In John chapter 10, verse 9, Yahushua says, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pasture. So Yahushua says, I am the gate. In John 14, 6, he says, Yahushua told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to me except, or to the Father, except through me. So Yahushua is not only the gate, he is the only gate. There's no other gate by which a person can enter in and find life and find fellowship with the Father. Yahushua is the only gate. So even in a tabernacle, the, the very entrance, to the tabernacle, it points to our king, Yahushua. So you go through the tabernacle, and you are an Israelite, and the first thing you do is you bring your sacrifice, right? And then you go through the ceremonies, including in the, included in those ceremonies is the burnt offering, or the offering that is placed there in the altar of burnt offering. So the sacrifice is burnt. It is offered to Yahuwah, and Leviticus chapters 1 to 7, gives us a list of different offerings. There's the burnt offering, the grain and drink offering, the peace or fellowship offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering. Many of these offerings involves the slaughtering of animals and the burning of their flesh on the altar of burnt offerings. And so this is the work of atonement, the forgiveness of one's sins, because the Bible says for one sins to be forgiven, another life has to be taken. In this case, it has to be an innocent animal. And so when the people of Israel commit sin, they need to present an animal. And so that's a sacrifice in and of itself, but they also see the, the killing of that animal. Can you imagine when you're looking at the animal and then it is slaughtered and it's, the life comes out of its eyes, you look at it and it's killed. And so this is a reminder about the seriousness of sin. And so when you have to go through that process for your sins to be forgiven, it reminds you, you better not sin. This is serious stuff. And so it tells us in a deep way that sin is very, very serious. And so it's something that we should not take lightly. So there was the burnt offering system. 
And when this was presented long ago, it also pointed to Yahushua, because in John 1 29, John the Baptist, when he was preaching about the Messiah, he preached about the Messiah in a way that's different from the Pharisees' understanding of the Messiah. See, the Pharisees' understanding of the Messiah was he was going to come as a king, right? And rule over the world, overcome the Roman emperor, and give all the kingdoms to Israel. This was the understanding of the rabbis and the Sanhedrin and all of the different, different Jewish scribes. But John the Baptist, he had a different idea. He says this Messiah is going to come as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. So we know he is the Lamb. And what do you do with a Lamb in the context of the Old Testament sacrifices? They are one of the animals used for the redemption of sin. And so if sin is going to be taken or sin is going to be redeemed for, it would mean Yahushua is going to die or be sacrificed as a Lamb of God. And the sacrifice of our King Yahushua was comprehensive and perfect. Hebrews 9, 13, 14, under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer could cleanse people's bodies for ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For, for by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And so Yahushua sacrificed the blood that he shed for us. Not only did he fulfill all the different uh, ceremonial sacrifices of the Old Testament, his blood sacrifice was perfect. He offered himself as a perfect sacrifice, which means there's no longer a need to repeat any other sacrifices because the sacrifice of a king was done once and for all when he offered himself. And so the altar of burnt offerings that pointed to the sacrifice of our king, Yahushua. Well, how about the laver? Because the laver is where the Levites, the priests, the high priests would go and cleanse themselves and bathe themselves for the purification process because they had to be cleansed. They had to be consecrated before they can receive any animals for the slaughtering and being offered to Yahuwah. So that represented cleansing and purity. So does that point to our King Yahushua? In the book of Ephesians 5, 25 to 26, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And so Apostle Paul is describing the love of our King Yahushua and the cleansing of the assembly or the church. It is done through the redeemed blood of our King, or the redemption through the, the shed blood of our King Yahushua. This is why Apostle Paul says Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Not only that, there's also cleansing by the washing with water through the word. And so Yahushua would not only provide his blood as a way by which our sins can be redeemed, he's also providing his word by which we can be washed with water through the word. So in different translations of Ephesians 5.26, it renders like this, to make her holy and clean, this is the church or the assembly, washed by the cleansing of God's word. So the word of Yahuwah and the word of Yahushua, when we have faith in them, it cleanses us. Yahushua says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. And so we have in the outer courtyard, we have those two items, the altar of burnt offerings and the laver, and it represents cleansing, purification, so that we can enter the holy place. And so that's the next space, the next section of the tabernacle, the holy place. And the holy place is distinct from the courtyard. Take note of that, right? So if you are a person of God, you could not enter the holy place. Who can only enter the holy place? The, holy, the, the priests, and the high priests and the priests and the Levites, the assistants to the priests. But an ordinary Israelite, he would not be allowed to enter the holy place. So we, can, we see here the distinction 
between the holy place and the outer courtyard. So in the holy place, we have these three artifacts or three furnitures. We have the one on the right, which is the table of bread. And then we have the menorah on the left, which is the candlestick. And directly in front, right in front of the veil or the curtain, we have the altar of incense. So these three items are found in the holy place. And so what are the purposes of these three items? Let's first take a look at the table of bread. And this is how it kind of looks like. It looks like unleavened bread, but maybe it could be leavened bread. But it's bread, right? This was given, this was eaten by the priests. How does this point to our King Yahushua? We all know this points to Yahushua because he says, I am the bread of life. And so it's really, really astonishing that every piece of artifact, every element we find in the tabernacle points to our King Yahushua. How about the menorah? This is the candlestick, and Yahushua said in John 8, 12, when Yahushua spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Take note, during the days of ancient Israel, when the temple or the tabernacle was still standing, it was an instruction by the Torah that the candlestick be lit. It is lighting, it is providing light 24 Seven, the same way Yahushua is the light of the world 24 uh, 7. So the menorah points to our king Yahushua. Well, how about the altar of incense? Well, what was the purpose of the altar of incense? What did that refer to symbolically? This is what the high priest will do on the day of atonement, right? Or uh, every time they would worship, they would have the uh, that box and carry a coal, the coal from the altar of burnt offering. And so it produces the fire and you put incense with the fire, it produces the smoke. And once they have atonement, the purpose of the smoke is so that it covers Yahuwah because his holiness needs to be veiled. Otherwise the people who are near or working at the tabernacle would be obliterated or would be killed. And so, that was the purpose of the incense. However, it's also deeper than that because the incense also symbolically represented something else. What is that? In the book of Psalm 141, O Yahuwah, I call to you, come quickly to me, hear my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. How many here like the smell? of incense. For many people, they enjoy the, 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 the aroma of incense. It's supposed to be a good smell, a holy fragrance, right? And so it points to Yahuwah accepting the praises and the prayers of his people. So it is a good fragrance. Yahuwah enjoys it. He does not detest it, but accepts it. And so pray the prayers of the saints, the prayers of the people of God, when it is done in the proper way and by the proper, uh, proper people, those who have been covered, re properly redeemed, well, their prayers are like incense, acceptable to our Father, Yahuwah. And so in Revelation 5 and 8, and when he had taken the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. But when do our prayers become fragrance, become a, a, a fragrance of incense to our Father Yahuwah? In 2 Corinthians 2 14 and 15, but thanks be to God for in our union with Christ. And that's the key. You see, outside of Christ, our prayers do not have the same effect. If we are in union with Christ, our prayers becomes like a sweet fragrance, a sweet smelling incense offered by Christ to God. And so the incense points to the prayers and the people who belong to Yahusha the Christ because his mediation, 15 is like it's speaking about the mediation of our King Yahusha. We are like a sweet uh, smelling incense offered by Christ to God. Gone. So when we look 
at the tabernacle, the altar of incense points to Yahushua as mediator, right? So that our prayers become like incense, fragrance accepted by Yahuwah. So we can see all these elements so far point to Yahushua. Now there's a difference, like we told you, between the holy place and the most holy place. And this distinction is, for, is emphasized when you see the veil. There's this massive curtain that separates the holy place from the holy of holies or the most holy place. This veil that you can see depicted by uh, that line there, that purple line or magenta, Fuchsia, Fuchsia, I don't know, that's how you pronounce it, that line. That's the veil that separates the holy place. Something happened to that veil. What does that veil represent? The book of Mark 15, 38 to 39, and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. See, that veil represented the flesh of our King Yahushua when he was killed. When his flesh died, the veil of the temple was torn. And so what did this allow the people of Elohim to do? In Hebrews 10, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Yahushua. By his death, Yahushua opened a new and living way through the curtain in the most holy place. Place. And so when Yahushua died and he sacrificed himself as a perfect offering, not only did he provide the blood that would atone for our sins and serve as the perfect sacrifice for eternal redemption, he also it also represents his uh, death, which caused the veil to be torn in half, so that by the, the tearing of his flesh, we now have access through the curtain to have a new life before the presence of our Father. Can you imagine, before this, there was only one person who was allowed to experience and to see for himself the Shekinah glory of Yahuwah. Who was that? The high priest. But he can only experience that presence of the Father in the most holy place once a year. And so this was a big event because Yahushua's death gave us a new and living way through the curtain into the most holy place. And so now we can enter the most holy place in the holy of holies where we find this amazing, amazing part of the holy place. What is that called? The Ark of the Covenant. And this is an artist's rendition of the Ark of the Covenant. And so it's a golden chest and on top, there's a cover called the Mercy Seat, which showcases two cherubim with their uh, um, wings folded in a protective manner. And so inside this Ark of the Covenant, we have three items. And so our next question is, because so far, when we went from the, the gate, the entrance gate, to the outer courtyard, to the holy place, and now we're at the most holy place so far, Every part of the tabernacle pointed to who? Our king, Yahushua, and his work of redemption and restoration. Do you see that? And so now we are here at the most holy place, and what we have is the Ark of the Covenant. And so surely the Ark of the Covenant also points to our king, Yahushua. So what's inside the Ark of the Covenant? Let's work there first and then look at the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. Let's go inside and from inside, work our way outside. So Hebrews 9, verse 4, in that room were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. Inside the Ark uh, were a golden jar containing manna. That's the first item. Aaron's staff with sprouted leaves. That's the second item. And the stone tablets of the covenant. And so we have three items inside the Ark of the Covenant. And so we know this must be important, right? Because it would not be in the Ark of the Covenant if it was not important. Agreed? I mean, if you were thinking about the most important part of the 
tabernacle. We know the tabernacle itself is important, but the most important part of the tabernacle is the Ark of the Covenant. So inside the Ark of the Covenant, we know is very close to the heart of Yahuwah. You agree? And so we need to know what is inside the Ark of the Covenant and what does it mean? What does it point to? How is it fulfilled in our King Yahusha? So let's go ahead and take a look at the golden jar containing mana. And so this is kind of a, an artist's rendition of what's inside the Ark of the Covenant. And so we have the mana on a golden bowl or a golden jar. And so what was the mana and what was that pointing to? The book of John 6, 47, 51, and tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the mana in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So what did the mana represent? It represents sustenance so that a person can live. But the mana also pointed to something greater than in, in a heavenly bread. It pointed to the heavenly man who is also the living bread. Who is that? Our king, Yahushua. You ate the mana, Yahushua said, but eventually you died. You were, you, were, you were given sustenance and nourishment. It made you strong. But eventually, all human beings, even if they ate all the mana that they could ever have, they would still die. But Yahushua says, if you eat the bread that is from heaven, the living bread, who is Yahushua, you would never die. And so this tells us about everlasting life, right? It tells us about everlasting life found through Yahushua. And so in the Ark of the Covenant, we see something magnificent. We see the hope for everlasting life represented by the manna. But not only that, I mean, how can you have everlasting life, right? How can a person have everlasting life when a person still dies? This is where we have the next item. We have the rod of Aaron. And so you notice in this rod, the rod of Aaron, it was sprouting with leaves, which is amazing. And we'll get to that later on. But what we have is the rod of Aaron. It's one of the things inside the Ark of the Covenant. You might be thinking, why on earth would Yahuwah decide to place as one of the three things inside the Ark of the Covenant? Why would he select a rod? And not only a rod, but the rod of Aaron, the staff of Aaron. Why would that be? What is its significance? And so we know from the Bible that the rod is symbolic of many things. For example, the rod represents authority from God. It's like the king's scepter. When the, when the king holds a scepter, it is like a representation of his power and authority. So the rod represents the authority from God. It represents the power of God. It also represents pastoral care. This is why in the much-loved biblical passage in the, book, in the book of Psalm 23, when it speaks of the Lord is my shepherd, right? Yahuwah is my shepherd. I will not want. We have the shepherd who guides us with his staff. That staff is also a rod. And so in the future, in the millennial kingdom, the Bible tells us Yahusha will rule with a rod of iron. And those who co-rule with him will rule with a rod of iron. That rod actually represents pastoral care. Because when you read it, and without thinking about what the rod means, a rod of iron, you're thinking, oh boy, this is going to be a dictatorial type of person, right? But no, it actually represents pastoral care. Pastoral care that is strong. This is why it's made of iron. The authority is strong. The, uh, the one providing leadership is strong because it is made of iron. But it's not about oppression. And so when it comes to ruling during the kingdom, there's no oppression of the weak. No, it's about pastoral care. And so that's what the rod represents, authority from God, the power of God, and pastoral care. But why does Yahuwah say, okay, I want you to include in the Ark of the Covenant, 
not just any rod, but the rod of Aaron, because it points to something that is related to everlasting life. Remember, the first item there was mana, the mana pointed to everlasting life, Yahusha being the living mana. And so what is the relationship between the rod and also the mana? Well, let's read the book of Numbers. Where is, what is the purpose of the rod of Aaron? Why do we have Aaron's rod in the first place? In Numbers 17, 6 to 7, so Moses spoke to the children of Israel, and each of their leaders gave him a rod apiece. For each leader, according to their father's houses, 12 rods, and the rod of Aaron was among the rods. And Moses placed the rods before Yahuwah in the tabernacle of witness. You see, at this point, there were people who were challenging the authority of Aaron as the high priest. And so they were telling Moses, why can't he be high priest? Who gets to decide who is high priest? And so this gets to Moses and to Yahuwah. And so Yahuwah gathers the people together, speaks to Moses, and tells Moses how it will be revealed who is the chosen high priest. And so there's going to be a test. And that test includes a rod. And so each of the family leaders is going to select uh, each of the families, each of the tribes, right, will select a leader, and the leader has a rod. And when you think of a rod, it's basically a branch. But what kind of branch is it? What kind of branch is a rod? A rod is a dead branch. Why is it dead? Because it's cut off from the tree. And so when the branch is cut off from the tree, it's dead. Can a branch that is cut off from the tree, can it still bear fruit? It cannot bear fruit. It's going to die and it's going to be dried and withered, right? And so here's the test. We're going to determine which one is selected and chosen, appointed by Yahuwah through the rods. And so the rod is taken into the into the tabernacle, the tabernacle of witness, and the following day, what happened? Eight down to nine. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron of the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds, had produced blossoms and yielded ripe almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before Yahuwah to all the children of Israel. And they looked, and each man took his rod. And so without any doubt, it was crystal clear who was chosen by Yahuwah. Who was that? Aaron. Because the rod of Aaron, unlike the other rods, was the one that bore fruit. It sprouted, put forth buds, it blossomed, and it even yielded. Right, right almonds. And so that was what you call a miracle, right? His rod was the only one who brought forth fruit. And the fruit it brought forth overnight were right almonds. Is that even possible with a regular almond tree? Can a regular almond tree produce almonds overnight that are ripe almonds? Can that happen? No. And so that was a miracle. And that miracle was even greater because it was a dead branch. And so what does this point to? Resurrection, right? What is dead is alive and produced forth ripe almonds. This is why the rod of Aaron was placed in the covenant box because it pointed to resurrection. It pointed to authority. But for this resurrection to take place, it points to a different rod, not just the rod of Aaron, right? But the rod of Aaron actually pointed to something that's greater. In Isaiah 11:1, 1, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and the branch shall grow out of his roots. And so the Aaron's rod that sprouted leaves and bore forth ripened almonds, it pointed to one day there's going to be the coming forth of a rod from the stem of Jesse. Who is that? 
Yahusha. It is through Yahusha that we will receive resurrection. And so as you can see, the rod of Aaron pointing to Yahusha points to resurrection, right? Because you have life from death. And also the mana points to everlasting life. And so Yahusha is the key. Now, what is its relation to the tablets of testimony? The tablets of testimony refers to the covenant. And so Yahuwah has a covenant. What is common in all the covenants that Yahuwah makes with his people for them to become a people of God, whether it be the Mosaic covenant or the new covenant, what they have in common are the commandments. And when we look at the testimony or the covenant, it is Yahuwah fulfilling his promise that he thought of long ago. Did you know that before Yahuwah created the universe, he already had a plan for salvation? What is that plan called? It's called the Logos. The Logos existed in the very beginning. The Logos was with God. The Logos was divine. It was the fulfillment of the Logos. Yahushua. This is why, because he was the Logos, every scripture points to Yahushua. We find the fingerprints of Yahushua in every part of scripture, including the tabernacle, because he's the Logos. In other words, Yahuwah created the universe with Yahushua in mind. Yahuwah created the universe for Yahushua, for his mediation and intercession. This is why the tabernacle pointed to Yahushua. And Yahushua was the only one who was able to perfectly obey what? The Ten Commandments. The two tablets is so important. Yahushua is the only one who is able to fulfill the Ten Commandments. And because of the New Covenant, those who belong to Yahushua, they are counted as perfect. And so those who belong to King Yahushua, they are represented as people who also have obtained righteousness through Yahushua because it, they're equipped with the Spirit to be able to obey the Ten Commandments. This is why Matthew 5, 17 and 18, the unfolding of the Logos, Yahushua says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So in the very beginning, Yahuwah had the Logos, Yahushua in mind, right? And then you have Abraham, you have Moses, you have the prophets. And so everything, one step, next step, next step, one phase, next phase, next phase, from one covenant to the next, all of that progression is pointing to Yahushua fulfilling the purpose of Yahuwah for redemption. And what is the purpose of redemption? So that we can be free to obey the Ten Commandments. This is why those who belong to the people of Yahushua, they don't reject the Ten Commandments, but they accept the Ten Commandments. This is why it's in the chest. It's inside the Ark of the Covenant. Can you imagine you're going to say, oh, we don't need the Ten Commandments anymore. Yahuwah is telling us the importance of the Ten Commandments. Commandments. So the Ten Commandments is a sign that we are living in the Spirit. If we obey the Ten Commandments, it's proof that we belong to our King Yahushua. And so if we belong to our King Yahushua, if we die, we will be resurrected. Once we're resurrected, we will have everlasting life. Do you see the connection between all three parts that are inside the Ark of the Covenant? It all points to Yahushua's work. Right? The Ten Commandments, the testimony, that's Yahushua's work. He enables us, empowers us through the Spirit to be able to obey the Ten Commandments, not only in letter, but also in spirit. Yahushua's work of resurrecting us, because even if we are to die, he's going to raise us back to life. And Yahushua's work of giving us life everlasting, giving us a body that never perishes. All of that is inside the Ark of the Covenant. So all this points to Yahushua and his work of redemption and restoration. However, how is all of this even possible? Well, if we go back to the Ark of the Covenant, you notice there's the cover. The covering of the Ark of the Covenant serves a purpose. On the Day of Atonement, 
when the people of Israel will be covered for their sins, forgiven completely of their trespasses. The high priest will pour the blood of a, the goat, the blood of the goat, the blood of the bulls on the atonement cover. Do you know what the atonement cover is called? It's called the mercy seat. The mercy seat. And when you think of the mercy seat, we think of a place or a throne, because when you have a seat, it is like a throne. Yahushua now sits at the right hand of God, right? He is the throne of mercy. And so we approach him for mercy and grace, Hebrews 4, 14 and 16, as our high priest who is in heaven. And so on the day of atonement, when blood is sprinkled on the atonement cover, what is Yahuwah going to do? In Leviticus 16, 2, then uh, Yahuwah said to Moses, warn your brothers, Aaron, not to enter the most holy place behind the inner curtain whenever he chooses. If he does, he will die. For the ark's cover, the place of atonement, is there, and I myself am present in the cloud above the atonement cover. So the purpose of the atonement cover, that is where Yahuwah is going to manifest his Shekinah glory, his glory, his presence, once atonement has been done. So it's called the place of atonement. The place of atonement is also the place of meeting, where Yahuwah meets with his people. And so how did Yahushua fulfill that? In Romans 5, 8 to 11, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have uh, now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of the son, how much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Yahushua Christ, through whom we now have receive reconciliation. And so the place of atonement or the cover of atonement, that's the place of atonement. That's the mercy seat because that's where we find reconciliation with who? Yahuwah. So that we can have a relationship with our father. This is possible because of Yahuwah's love. He sends his son to atone for our sins so that we can be reconciled with the father. Why do we need to be reconciled with the father? Because Yahuwah is holy. We are unholy undeserving. His holiness is so vast and deep. We cannot just enter into his presence. But Yahuwah wants to have a relationship with us because of his love. And so he provides a way through Yahushua by his shed blood. Our sins are covered. And so this is displayed in the tabernacle. You see, the tabernacle expresses the holiness of Yahuwah and the love of Yahuwah in one. And this is what the tabernacle is all about the, the holiness of Yahuwah and the love of Yahuwah. It is a picture of Yahusha. This is why Yahusha, if you notice in scripture, is referred to as the image of God. And so Yahusha is the perfect image of his father, Yahuwah. Well, what does it mean if he is the image of the father? Well, he's not the image in terms of physical image, but the image of holiness and love. And that is what the tabernacle is about. And so Yahushua is the image of his father, Yahuwah, because of his perfect holiness and his perfect love. And so when we think of the tabernacle, we should think Yahuwah's purpose for why he gave us the tabernacle. It reflects his love and his holiness. Take a look at Exodus. Uh, then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of Yahuwah filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it, and the glory of Yahuwah filled the tabernacle. So the purpose of the tabernacle was so that Yahuwah can guide his people Israel to go through the wilderness journey. And this is really the purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles, to remember how Yahuwah, through the tabernacle guided his people, Israel. This is why we have a feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. It's all about remembering how God tabernacled with his people in the wilderness. You see, the wilderness was the punishment of Yahuwah because they were faithless. They grumbled against Yahuwah. And so Yahuwah says, you're going to have to stay in this wilderness for how long? 38 years, right? It was a punishment of 
Yahuwah. But even in punishment, Yahuwah shows mercy and compassion and love. Does he not? This is why he provides a way to guide his people. It's called the tabernacle. In other words, God is telling his people, Israel, yes, you are a faithless people. Yes, you are a stubborn people. But you know, I'm going to lead you anyways. I'm going to give you a tabernacle. And so the tabernacle provides the way for Yahuwah to lead his people because of the glory, the glory that is manifested inside the tent or inside the tabernacle. And how does this point to our King Yahushua? It fits perfectly. Look at Hebrews 1.3. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. So Yahushua radiates the glory of the Father. Yahushua also bears the character of God. Remember the 13 attributes of God about forgiveness of sin, about kindness and love and mercy and compassion. Yahushua also expresses the very character of God. And because of that, he radiates the Shekinah glory of Yahuwah. And so in this way, Yahushua not only represents the tabernacle, he also represents the presence of God that is in the tabernacle. This is why the name of Yahushua, the one of his titles, his name is Yahushua, one of his titles, according to prophecy and according to the angel, is what? Emmanuel. Remember? Emmanuel. God with us through Yahushua. So that's the tabernacle. But the tabernacle not only points to Yahushua, it also points to how we ought to worship Yahushua. And so we see the pattern and progression of worship expressed in the tabernacle. Here is the tabernacle again. Because remember, we ought to live for Yahushua. Yahushua has given us a new way. He has given us the living way. In other words, he has given us a way to worship without the ceremonies. It's the living way. We can, ex we can enter the most holy place. However, we need to learn how to apply this in our life. And so the way we do it in the assembly of Yahushua is once a week we have a gathering. It's called a worship service where we meet together as an assembly. And what do we do? We worship. You know, probably what, what should we do when we have worship? When we worship and gather together every Sabbath, what should we do when we worship? We follow this pattern, the pattern of worship, because this was purchased for us by our king, Yahushua. So what is the pattern of worship? We can see the pattern of worship through the progression of worship. And so it involves the following items, the altar of burnt offering, laver, Temple of bread, lampstand, all provinces are in the covenant. Obviously, literally, we no longer have those things. We don't have an altar of burnt offering, do we? We don't have that. We don't have a labor. We don't have a table of bread. We don't have a lampstand. We don't have an altar of incense. We don't have the Ark of the Covenant. But who do we have? Who do we have? We have the ancient. We don't need all that because we have it. The living embodiment, the very fulfillment of the tabernacle, Yahushua. And so we can practice worship. However, we can learn how we ought to worship through Yahushua by learning the, the pattern of these artifacts or, or these furniture pieces of furniture of the tabernacle, right? And so what does the altar burnt offering reveal to us when we worship beloved brethren, for example? This coming Sabbath, or this coming or when we celebrate worship, when we have worship gatherings, we present ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's the first thing. When we show up for worship, we're not there because somebody forced us to worship. Because there's a lot of people who only worship because we're being forced to. If I don't worship, well, my overseer or whatever is going to call me, my dad is going to call me to do worship. I mean, it's good to remind each other that we should worship. But we need to ask ourselves, why am I worshiping? Am I worshiping? Am I worshiping because somebody tells me I should worship? Am I being coerced to worship? Because if that's the case, then we're not a living sacrifice. We need to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. The lover, what does that represent? Well, that represents re renewing one's life to repent, 
And so already the attitude, when we meet together for worship, the attitude should be one of repentance, reflection, and sacrifice, right? We need to sacrifice ourselves. And so that should be the attitude for worship. And so what is the tabernacle? Uh, how does it inform us concerning how, to, how, concerning how we ought to worship? That table of bread, that's about spiritual nourishment. And this is why we study and preach the word of God. It's like food and nourishment for our soul. It's like bread for our soul. The lampstand, what does that represent? Seek guidance. So we pray. When we have worship services, we pray to Yahuwah. We also sing praises to Yahuwah, which is like incense offered to our Father. And throughout this service, throughout this process of worship, we are hoping for the experience of the presence of Yahuwah. And so the tabernacle points to how we ought to worship in spirit and truth. And so the tabernacle points to Yahushua, and Yahushua is telling us this is how we ought to worship the Father. And so this is why, beloved brethren, if you notice, the one thing that we should never, ever abandon is our sacred assembly when we meet together for worship. It's something that we need to be committed in doing because it's so important when it comes to our life. And not only do we need to see the pattern of worship, but also the progression of worship. And so we see how the tabernacle tells us how we worship every Sabbath, how we worship every time we gather together. But it also tells us about our journey. You see, when we are called into fellowship with Yahushua, we go on a journey, right? When we have a relationship with our king, it's like uh, we have to finish our race. Journey, a race, this is our life. And so it begins when we are called into fellowship with Yahushua. It begins with our baptism. And so baptism should not be the finish line. It is the starting line. And so from the starting line until the finish line, there's like different phases we go through. And so the different phases is represented by the three sections of the tabernacle. And so the pattern of the tabernacle not only points to Yahushua, not only points to the pattern of worship, it also points to the progression of our walk and our journey towards the promised land. Because it begins with the courtyard, right? The courtyard is all about the burnt offering, the laver, what does that tell you? It's about redemption. It's about, it's about the giving of, it's about Yahushua's giving up his life for our sins, right? So that we can be forgiven. The laver also could represent baptism. This is the death of the old self so that we can be renewed in Christ. Yahushua, so we can be added to his body. And so this is about the work of redemption. So the outer court represents redemption. This is the beginning point of our journey, the outer court. Next, we go to the holy place. The holy place, we have the table of showbread, the menorah, altar of incense. What does this kind of point to? It refers to our growth. When we are baptized, we are born again. We are infants. We need to mature. We need to grow. And so you can say the outer courtyard represents redemption or justification. This one, the holy place, represents our sanctification. Our maturity of faith, our growth towards perfection. And at last, we go to the holy of holies, the most holy place where we have the presence of the Father. Now, we have an experience of the presence of the Father, but our experience is limited by our flesh. But one day, we're going to be in the kingdom of heaven. And when that is, has taken place, all of the things that hinder our the full expression of Yahuwah's presence will be removed. This is when we are glorified. So that points to our glorification. And so this is our journey. When we live a life, when we place our trust and hope in Yahushua, are baptized into his body, the spiritual regeneration kicks in. It begins with redemption. It continues to sanctification. One day, we're going to experience glorification. And so right now, where are we in these phases, or are we right there in the middle, right? Sanctification. We were baptized, yes. We repented, yes. But now the ongoing work 
of growing up, becoming mature in faith must be, we must be a continuous. We should maintain continuous spiritual growth so that one day when the trumpet is blown, we will experience the beginning phases of our glorification, which is what we look forward to. So the progression of worship is seen in the tabernacle, redemption, sanctification, glorification. There's one more thing, because right now, we're waiting for that day when we'll be, we'll be glorified. Bible says we need to suffer first, and then glory comes, right? It's not the other way around. Not glory first, and then suffering later. No, suffering first, and then glorified, and the glorification later. So right now, in the process of sanctification, we go through and endure suffering, persecution. It's it's part of the sanctification process. This is why we should not complain, oh, brother, I am sick today. Oh, I got persecuted today. Oh, nobody believes me. We should not be complaining. It's part of sanctification. When we have to endure suffering, when we have to endure affliction, when we have to endure persecution, it's part of sanctification. But if we remain enduring, eventually the sanctification leads to our glorification. And so when we are in the midst of suffering, there's something that we need to look at because it's part of the tabernacle. There's one part of the tabernacle that we haven't discussed yet. Do you see it? Do you see the one part of the tabernacle we haven't really discussed yet? What is that? <laughs> the tent cover. The tent cover is made of goat hair, made of goat hair. That's what the tent cover is made of. And the goat also represents who? Yahusha. Of the, as, a, as part of the, uh, the goat sacrifice in the Day of Atonement. And so the covering made of goat hair, it completely surrounds the tabernacle. And there's only one entrance who happens to be the door, who happens to be Yahusha. In other words, what Yahusha is telling us, what the Bible is communicating to us, through the typology of the tabernacle is the protection we have. Because when we belong to Yahushua, he's the door. And once we enter in, we're completely covered. Isn't that nice? We're covered. In other words, we're safe inside. When we're in Yahushua, we are safe. We have eternal security. This is why we can't cover made of goat hair that completely cover the tabernacles, the tabernacle symbolizes the care and protection of Yahushua as our great shepherd. If you still remember the illustration of King Yahushua gave when he was here on earth, he says, I am the door to the sheepfold, right? And this is a good illustration of that. This is not like kind of a, a tabernacle to you, right? It's, it's an illustration Yahusha used, and it kind of mirrors the tabernacle because Yahusha is the door, and the way it played out during the days of our King Yahusha on earth, the shepherds, they had the flock of sheep, and they would go from place to place, and they would enjoy the pasture, right? But when it's time to sleep, when it's time to feed, or when it's, it, it's time to rest, they go inside a sheep pen. And when they go inside the sheep pen, Yahusha as the door, you have to enter through him as the door. And Yahusha counts them one by one. Okay, this sheep is here, this sheep is here, this sheep is here, right? <laughs> and so once they're inside, they're safe. And so the tabernacle points to the protection and care of Yahusha as our great shepherd. Take a look at John 10. Uh, those who heard Yahusha use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me, before me were thieves and robbers. But the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastors. And so Yahushua is saying that he is the good shepherd. What does that mean? It means listen to his Voice. You see, Yahushua used an illustration of a shepherd and his flock. The flock represents the sheep. 
and the sheep follow the shepherd. And so when the shepherd goes to a certain journey or wherever the shepherd leads the sheep, they follow, right? And so from time to time, they stop by a sheep pen so that they can rest. And so in that case, he becomes the door. Enter in, right? And you will be safe because who is the protector? Yahusha. He is the door after all. Once you're inside, you cannot come out unless Yahusha allows you to come out because there's some sheep who are stubborn. And who wants to come out? And so if you really want to come out, then Yahushua really can't stop. And so those who follow the voice of our King Yahushua, they remain under his care. And so they go in and out and find the pastures. And so it's time to feed, when it's time to enjoy the pasture lands, they come out of the sheep pen. When it's time to sleep, time to rest, they go back into the sheep pen. But who's the one always shepherding? Our King Yahusha. So this is an illustration of our life. And so for us to be under the care and protection of our King Yahusha, we need to recognize and accept him as our great shepherd. See, the problem is, according to our King Yahusha, is many people today, they follow a different shepherd. Right? There are people today who don't, who don't recognize Yahusha as the good shepherd. They recognize someone else as the good Shepherd, but brethren, if we want to belong to Yahusha, if we want to be his sheep, his voice is what we need to follow. He must be our great shepherd. So if we follow his voice and we remain accepting him and allowing him to be our great shepherd, what is our what is the promise for all of us? In the final passage of our studies today, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me for my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the father's hand. What is the promise of our King Yahushua? If he will remain the shepherd of our lives, Yahushua says, if you listen to my voice and if you follow me, I will give you eternal life line you see if it's time to enter in and be safe you hear his voice when it's time to enjoy the pasture lands we have to always listen for his voice when he says it's time to go in now when we follow his voice we will always be protected and when we are in his sheep pen we are protected because the father and he will be the one to make sure Nobody snatches us from his end. So the tabernacle points to the sheep pen, points to Yahushua as the high priest and the great shepherd who protects and cares for us until the end when we are given life everlasting. Okay? That is our lesson. Let us stand and we shall pray together. Almighty and most holy Father Yahuwah, thank you so much for again blessing your people. Thank you for this wonderful message of love, care, and protection. You have given the tabernacle to your ancient people, Israel, because despite their stubbornness, you desire to be with them, to fellowship with them. That is your nature. You are long-suffering and kind and merciful, compassion, filled with unfailing love. And so, Father, yes, you are holy, but you're also loving. You always find a way so that you can bring yourself near to your people. And so you sent your begotten son. He is the fulfillment of the tabernacle. Through him, we find your presence and enjoy fellowship with you. Yahushua, our king, you are our great shepherd. You are our high priest. Indeed, the scriptures speak and point to you. And so we praise you. May you accept us as your servants. Help us to recognize you in our life, to accept you as our king as our great shepherd who cares for each and every one of us. Yet we know there's the enemy on the prowl, seeking to devour those who belong to you. May you please be there to defend and protect us. Teach us to discern your voice. May we never replace you with any other shepherd. You are our one and only good shepherd who takes care of each and every one of us. Father, we believe that you have listened to our prayers and that you will prepare us for our upcoming feast, 
the Feast of Tabernacles help us to understand its purpose and meaning and how we can please you on those appointed days. We believe, Father, you have listened to our prayers. We ask everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahusha HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters in the faith, thank you for attending our Bible study for today. If you have any questions, uh, please send your queries uh, to info at aoy.today. And of course, let us continue to prepare ourselves for our next uh, convocations in keeping up with the feasts. We began with the Feast of Trumpets, our wake-up call to repentance so that we can receive the blessing on the Day of Atonement. And so we celebrate the Day of Atonement as a day of blessing because Yahuwah manifests his love and his desire to cover our weaknesses because he is, after all, Yahuwah. And so now, the Feast of Tabernacles, we are to rejoice in fellowship with Yahuwah and Yahusha. So it's an eight-day fellowship of rejoicing. Um, and so it begins with the first day this coming Friday, September 29 at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and concludes on the eighth day, October the 6th, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So the eighth day is also going to be in person and will be in Fremont. Hopefully we can all be there together, but of course we know that it's not possible because many of us live far away places, but we can always join through online platforms. Um, so hopefully we can continue to prepare ourselves and let us attend our Bible history project so that we can be informed concerning the purpose and the meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles. Let us all, and may Yahuwah Abba and Yahusha HaMashiach bless all of us.